नमस्ते माइकल जी वेलकम आपका अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन में स्वागत है <laughs> नमस्ते रजनी तु, तुम्हारे सब कुछ ठीक है जी बढ़िया है <laughs> आप कैसे हैं <laughs> हाँ सब कुछ ठीक है <laughs> <laughs> बढ़िया <laughs> So, uh, Michael, we'll begin at the same place as everyone else. What is your earliest recollection of either the experience or the concept of ahimsa? Well, my earliest recollections that have to do with ahimsa were perhaps negative ones because uh, growing up uh, as a boy in American culture, the time when I did. Uh, you you didn't have inbuilt feelings of compassion and some acts of unkindness that I fell into as a child, and I was uh, in some cases shocked by the effects of my unkindness, and so that kind of prepared me to uh, get interested in ahimsa. And then, uh, much much later, I. I, I like to think of this episode as kind of the beginning. Uh, I was uh, in Greenwich Village, uh, where all this our bohemian artistic friends lived, and uh, I was sitting on my motorcycle, in fact, and there was a car in front of me that had its radio on, and it was a convertible, so I could hear what was going on. And it was a rally in the South. This was during the free speech, the uh, civil rights movement. So uh, one of the uh, African American participants in the rally got up and and was very angry, and he said, uh, "Look, they're beating on us. Why don't we beat them?" And the uh, par- the speaker, who was in charge of the ceremony, I guess the service, he said, "Because that's not who we are," and that made a profound impression on me that. Your commitment to nonviolence, or the opposite, in a very profound sense, defines who you are. So after that, I, I got keenly interested. We we knew nothing to speak of about Gandhi, um, but the really significant change came much later, in 1966, when I met my uh, teacher, Ignatius Schroeder. And he had uh, had had a very profound experience meeting Gandhi in the 40s, and so he he revered Gandhi as many of the great sages of modern India did. And he uh, the way he would talk about Gandhi was kind of paradoxical because it, it led me to see that on the one hand Gandhi was much greater than I had thought. He was much, much greater than a political figure, uh, uh, but on the other hand, he was much more accessible. He wasn't up on a pedestal. There were things that you could do with your own mind, your own life, that gave you a little bit, at least, of that power and that awareness that he had. So that really launched me. Uh, Into the search, if you will, for Gandhi, and I've been. Uh, then later on in my university career, I had the opportunity to work it into my uh, professional life. Though that wasn't easy, they they didn't really have a category for Gandhi, uh, but I had enough uh, seniority to be able to force my way in, and and so combining my, the spirit, the little bit of progress I was making spiritual with spiritual practice, namely meditation, combined that with the rather uh, substantial training that I had as a scholar, uh, gave me these, these insights that I now use in my work. Uh, so where did you meet Ek- Eknath Ji? Uh, that was uh, on the Berkeley campus. Uh, you know, I felt that I was extremely lucky. People were dropping out and going to the Himalayas, uh, or at least at least to New Mexico, 
And all I had to do was walk 200 yards across campus and he was giving afternoon talks on meditation in the, the meditation room, as it was then called, in the student union building. So uh, I went to hear him there and was very impressed. Uh, really liked just about everything he was saying and uh, confirmed thoughts that I had that other people were not resonating with really. I was kind of locked up inside myself. And then after a while I, I went to him and I, I <laughs> this, it sounds so ridiculous now, but I offered to go and live with him. <laughs> it was, wasn't that kind of me. <laughs> And he was very, very calm. And he said, well, I usually have people move in somewhere nearby so we get to know one another. And I was impressed with his reasonableness and his non-grasping, you know, the aparigraha. That he, other teachers who were around at that time were desperately trying to recruit people, get more and more on board. And he was uh, not, he didn't need that. Mm. So in course of time, I came to see that he, uh, he didn't need anything from me. And that was really quite amazing. <laughs> but I needed a whole lot from him. Yes, yes. I know that uh, uh, you're becoming a disciple, in a sense, of Eknath Ji. Introduced you to a whole universe of uh, spiritual learning. Uh, can you describe where in that journey, nonviolence appeared as a central theme for you? That is a really good question. Um, I, I may not be able to give an exact answer, but nonviolence was always at the back of my mind because of my, you know, I, I, I came to Ishran out of the free speech movement and I knew something was wrong with the way we were going about that movement. The, the disrespect for persons bothered me. In, the, uh, in 1964, a student uprising took place on the Berkeley campus where I was a graduate student. And it was mostly around the issue of uh, race. Uh, there was a proposition that was going to make it possible for a renter of a house or an apartment to discriminate against prospective uh, rentees but without saying why they had rejected them. So we all knew that that was going to keep, uh, for example, African-American people out of renting in certain areas. So we wanted to organize against that. It's called Proposition 13. And the campus uh, authority said no politics on campus and they wanted us to take our tables away. That seemed to us to be a violation of free speech. And we rebelled big time and we shut the place down and it's launched a whole wave of the 60s. Okay. Now that didn't actually end up having good results, but uh, I didn't know that at the time. But I did know that something was bothering me about my close friends and colleagues in the movement, uh, the way that they disrespected people felt wrong to me. So I came to Ishrin with that uh, dilemma in my mind. And then, uh, as I said, later on, of course, I began to see that, as I put it today, you cannot graft nonviolence onto the old story. That is, if you believe in Western style materialism, that we're all physical objects with no meaning and we're separate from one another, nonviolence does not make sense. It does not fit into that paradigm. So uh, my latest book and the other aspects of the project that we're working on uh, is where I try among other things to integrate uh, nonviolence with the new story. And I came to the conclusion that the new story is incomplete as a story without being able to embrace nonviolence. And secondly, and more importantly, really, if you want to get the new story adopted 
if you want it to be the prevailing paradigm to replace the old one, nonviolence is the only method that will work to do that because mm -hmm. uh, you cannot compel people to change their minds and hearts. You can only persuade them. So that is the argument of the, the Third Harmony Project, and we've expressed it in my book and a film and in a board game. Um, Michael, here I would request you to say a bit more about the new human story, because uh, most people have grown up on the claim, uh, the educational uh, influence that life is short, nasty, and brutish. Human beings are basically default assumption is that we are inclined to be violent. And I know that when you say the new human story, uh, you are drawing on a wealth of wisdom and research. So could you briefly, you know, just share that with our listeners? Oh, I'd be so happy to, <laughs> Rajni. Yes. Um, so it, it's the subtitle of my book, The Third Harmony, is Nonviolence and the New Story of Human Nature. So the, there was a revolution in modern science that began at the turn of the 20th century you know, with the discovery of quantum theory. And I just learned yesterday that there was a, a brilliant experiment conducted at MIT just two years ago, basically proving that uh, all of existence is one, to put it very simply. Uh, and so on that physical basis, after a lag of some something like 50 years, natural science and psychology started to weigh, weigh in. And uh, there, so that you now have this shift in the uh, orientation around nature and human nature from one that was, you might call Freudian, which is looking for breakdowns, looking for the negative for aggression and violence to one that looks to cooperation and, and compassion and harmony. And of course, there's an enormous wealth of information stored in nature, not to mention human nature, about these uh, socially positive and constructive capacities. So we come to an absolutely new window in human civilization where ancient wisdom, which was most highly developed in India and modern science, which was most highly developed at first in Europe and in the West, but now you know, Indians are often taking the lead, uh, which now are reinforcing one another. So if you know how to balance them, like what can the exploration of the physical universe, animal behavior, conflict science, how far does that go? And where it ends is where the spiritual wisdom of ancient traditions, East and West, takes over. So people no longer have to choose between religion and science. If their religion touches even so ever so slightly on its spiritual basis, there will be no conflict between what modern science is saying. Now, in India, you have this great blessing that the two were never divorced. You know, science... <laughs> The gurus, the sages were perfectly scientific in their outlook. They just had a different, different set of tools. So this is a tremendous breakthrough in human culture, which has yet to be exploited. People are still act as though they were nasty, crude, brutish, and short, as you can see from the election that's just taking place in the United States. To summarize the new story, uh, I would say using a model that was developed by Amit Goswami at the University of Oregon, that the universe uh, exhibit it brought into being by what's called downward causality. That is, it is primarily a universe of consciousness 
you know, pratyanam brahmaha, as the Vedas say, all is consciousness. Consciousness creates an appearance of energy, and that creates finally through maya the appearance of, of material reality, not the other way around. And the, the uh, ramifications of this are that we are conscious beings in evolution. We have not yet reached our goal by any means, except people like Gandhi did. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a small but extremely significant degree of control over our own destiny that we are essentially one with, well, ultimately all of existence, one with all of nature, one with all of life, and, uh, of course, one with one another. As the Gita says in chapter 16, when you see the self everywhere, how can the self want to injure the self? So uh, that, that is, a, you know, one of the main, those are the main features of the new story. Mm. That we are evolving virtual beings. We are here to discover our unity with one another. And we have the tools within us to do that. In this, in this worldview, um, can we assume that every human being, while having this potential, is at a different stage of uh, development or evolution in every lifetime? So, uh, what, how do we engage then with people who are not able to act from love, who are not uh, able to experience uh, compassion? Uh, what is the challenge for those who do want to act from love and compassion? This is, uh, Rajani, precisely violence comes in. Because uh, by acting towards them, and that by that I mean in behavior, in words, and even in thought, whereby we recognize the divinity in them, we are holding up a mirror to that part of themselves which they had forgotten. And so we are, to, to that degree, able to awaken the compassionate self, the wise self within them. Now, that doesn't always mean that in every interaction this will work, in the sense that it will get them to stop exploiting you or whatever they're doing. But it does mean that it always works on some level. That's why when you commit yourself to nonviolent way of living and nonviolent practice, things get better and better and better. And whereas if you don't make that commitment, you just end up lurching from catat from crises without solving anything. So yeah. that's a clear indication that nonviolence is built into nature and human nature. Over the last uh, more than half century, Michael, where you have been such a valiant soldier on this path, from a distance, it looks like things have kept getting worse for American society as a whole. Is that a wrong impression? Are things more diverse? and more nuanced actually, uh, or uh, is the mainstream news media telling us the accurate story about increase in violence? Uh, how I wish, Rajni, that I could say that that was a wrong impression. I, I, I will say this, that there is a, a small segment of American society and uh, elsewhere in the world, throughout the world, 
a segment of people. There is a small and growing group of people, not organized together in any way, not even for the most part primarily aware of each other. These are people who have made some kind of uh, step forward, if you will, in spiritual evolution so that they are dimly aware of the unity of life and everything that goes with it. The, the fact that they have undeveloped capacities within themselves, that they don't need to buy things, be happy, they don't need to compete with them, be fulfilled. So this is a small and growing contingent. The mainstream is nowhere near yet. They are just getting more and more uh, violent and abusive as the uh, mass media, uh, the effect of which cumulative is making things worse and worse. So how this will play out, uh, I do not know, but I'm very encouraged by Gandhi saying, who will dare limit capacity to undo wrongs? <laughs> or in a, more, in a more prosaic sense, Norman Cousins used to say, nobody knows enough to be a pessimist. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I cannot predict. Uh, I, I would say looking at the trends, here's what, how I would put it. Looking at the trends right now, I don't see any hope that we will be able to rescue life on, on this planet. However, that's only speaking as far as I can see now. And I know my vision is limited. Uh, I, am, I haven't been called to the throne of God to discuss plans. Uh, so um, my hope lies in the potentials, which at this point are not much in evidence, but that they have the potential to completely change things, that of that I have no doubt. Why Third but, Harmony? Michael, you've called your new film, you're, you've made a documentary film that you've been dreaming of making for many, many years, and, and you've chosen to call it The Third Harmony. Can you speak about that, please? Yes, indeed, Rajni. Uh, thank you. It goes back to a, a statement of Shankara, Shankaracharya, that we, we suffer from the environment, we suffer from other human beings, and we suffer from ourselves. So reflecting on that, Sri Yishin once said, okay, then we need to establish harmony with the universe, harmony with other beings, especially human beings, and harmony within ourselves. So that is the third harmony. And one of the things that I argue in the book where I get to discuss this in some detail, is that most of the people in that uh, advanced segment of cultural creatives or spiritual progressives or whatever you want to call them, most of them have are pretty good on the third, on the first harmony and the second harmony. But in terms of being able to need for personal development and the capacity that we have, for personal development, things are a little undeveloped. So it's that third harmony, the capacity to be at peace within ourselves, which is the ultimate of yoga. Uh, that's where we need to focus all of, more of our energy. Mm, mm, mm. At the political level, uh, are you? How do you deal with the magnitude of, in a sense, the gridlock? Uh, and here I'm referring to the fact that despite such diverse efforts uh, of war resistors and, and I think in many ways these last 50, 60 years have seen really an expansion of the energies that you're describing. But the arms industry uh, seems to continue to thrive more than ever before. So... What is the reason for this? Is it that our efforts cannot match the, the systemic structural violence? 
Well, uh, Rajini, that is a very profound question that we all need to be thinking through. Uh, and I guess on one level, uh, what, what you said is true, that our efforts at this point are not potent enough to overcome the forces of egotism and uh, greed and separateness that have basically, in terms of the United States, taken over the, uh, the machinery the structures of government so that, for example, a person voting in a Midwestern state like Nevada, Arizona, his vote counts seven times more than my vote in California because uh, this, this uh, distortion toward evil, to put it quite bluntly, has been progressively built into the system more and more. And I think that it has been enabled to do that by the mass media. The mass media have overwhelmed every other form of uh, education, of acculturation that human society has developed. And I like to say, you know, that uh, the Muslim invasion of India that uh, happened in the 12th century. Indians had just about enough time to assimilate it. The, the British takeover was more difficult, but the, they, they did it. But the hardest of all has been the takeover by Hollywood. So, you know, <laughs> once you make it your own, you have Bollywood, uh, then I, I think you've inherited our problem. So, but what you were just asking uh, made me think of a quotation I just read this morning from a famous Indian, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And she said, we feel that what we are doing is just a drop in the ocean. But if that drop was not in the ocean, I think the ocean would be less because of that missing drop. I do not agree the way of doing things. To us, what matters is an individual. Yes, indeed. There is such a diversity of uh, <clears throat> community groups and organizations and centers uh, like the Meta Center, which you have set up, or in many ways, your cent each center is unique, but there is a diversity of nonviolent striving on the ground in the US. Will that in some way be able to hold the ground if, as many people are fearing, this election result is followed by uh, an outbreak of violence? What are the prospects? The prospects are not all that dim. We have been preparing for months. And for example, in the United States, or something that Meta is a part of, is called the Shanti Sena Network. And this is a coordinating body that uh, coordinates the work of groups around the country who train volunteers to be monitors at um, events, public events, you know, marches, rallies, things like that, and learn a lot of de-escalation skills. And it's become quite a technology. For example, they talk about bystander intervention training and one thing or another. And, and I'm happy to report that thousands of election monitors have been trained by these groups and that by and large, the, at the polling stations, I have yet to read of any outbreak of violence or even intimidation. Thanks surely in part to these thousands of well-trained volunteers. Now they are also committed to attempt de-escalation in outbreaks of violence, which mm -hmm. of course can be dangerous. But I think what we know from the last, oh, about 25, 30 years, 
groups like Nonviolent Peace Force, uh, that it can be very effective and not nearly as dangerous as military intervention. And there's a, a very dramatic skin in our film about two fellows who were in South Sudan in a, a refugee camp and the camp was invaded by an armed militia and these two fellows, one was from the UK, one was from Central America, they ended up in a tent with 14 women and children. The militia burst in and said, you guys out. And they said, we are international protection officers and we're not leaving. And these people heavily armed as they were, they turned around and left. And that happened three times. And so 59 people were killed outside that tent, but the women and children in that tent were saved. So we know now and can document that this is a powerful method and groups are learning how to use it. Of course, in diverse ways, uh, but they, I do think they are aware that it is a fundamental underlying principle that they all uh, participate in, the principle of nonviolence. Uh, I'm sorry, that it's an underlying principle that? The principle of ahimsa is what they, what they have in common. Mm -hmm. Now, the degree of commitment, of course, will vary from individual to individual. You know, Gandhi spoke about the nonviolence of the weak versus the nonviolence of the strong. And I think a lot of these people are somewhere in between. I, I know I am. Uh, but it adds up to the expression of a nonviolent force in That's this right. society. I know that you have also done such work at the international level. You have been part of a diverse network uh, that has intervened in many conflict situations. Are there any learnings, any observing, uh, any observations from that experience that you would like to share here? I'm really happy you asked that, Rajni, because this is really one of the big success stories. You know, I used to say uh, back 25, 30 years ago that, you know, we go out into a conflict stricken area, we risk our lives, we save people, and nobody knows about it. And what's more, we don't tell one another. But that I used to say sort of tongue in cheek that bank robbers do more debriefing after a bank robbery than we do after a nonviolent intervention. But all that has dramatically changed, thanks mainly to one organization, Nonviolent Peace Force. And I will be on a panel this Sunday with the director, the uh, executive director of Nonviolent Peace Force, Tiffany Eastham, and that we, have, we say a lot about that in our film. What uh, NP has done, uh, may, I hope to think my prodding them had something to do with this. Uh, what they have done is convened six uh, events, one on each inhabited continent, specifically for the purpose of gathering uh, best practices and worst practices from these experiences around the globe. And there's now about 30 or so organizations who have done this in every part of the world. You know, in Canada with First Nations people in South America, in Europe and, and Asia, everywhere, Africa. So. That process is almost concluded and they, they have an excellent team that is collecting those results. A lot of them are already online. If you go to nonviolentpeaceforce.org, I'm pretty sure you can find it, uh, but it is going to be a priceless document. At the same time, uh, and this is primarily American and European phenomenon, there is an enormous growth of scholarship 
on what makes nonviolence work, you know, launched by a, a famous book called Why Civil Resistance Works by Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan. And that is a whole field now. I can't keep up with it. Every day, more, more of these articles come in. I can't read them all. But I'm happy to say that one of the things that I've longed for is happening, and that is these scholars who do this systematic study of what's, what to, how to do it and when it works are feeding their information directly into the movements. And that is brand new, and that is a tremendous development. I think it has a lot, a lot of potential. Excellent. Some of these uh, movements have uh, taken the more pragmatic view on nonviolence. Uh, you know, one view is that, for example, Gene Sharp's uh, manual uh, was a shift away from Gandhian nonviolence because it was more tactical and uh, did not depend on changing the opponent's mind or having a change of heart in the opponent. Is this a major issue for you? Because I'm, I'm very happy to. No, no, go ahead. I'm very happy. I'm very happy to say that it is no longer a major issue. Uh, I, I used to worry about it a lot, and I tried to uh, put on a, a serious debate within the nonviolence community, which for various reasons didn't happen. And I used to think this is you know, causing a lot of difficulty, and I was very upset and angry about it. I was strictly a Gandhian man, of course, and, uh, we kind of unhappy about the what we used to call strategic nonviolent community, but it, it nobody really worries about it anymore. I mean, for example, uh, at one of these intervention organizations, which has been around for a long time, called Peace Brigades International, they've worked it out, and they say we we'll go into the field as a representative from PBI. You have to behave nonviolently. What you believe, you know, whether you kick your dog, get home, uh, all of that is your business. But when you when you're out there with us, you've got to be nonviolent. So that was one way. And I think what's happening is even people who just have these this strategic or what you call pragmatic commitment, when they get out and do something and they feel it inside, you know, what, the, what they went through, what kind of a magical effect it had on the opponent. A lot of them, they've begun to say, hey, you know, there's something more to this. So they get interested in the post-Sharpian uh, awareness of the, what you might call principled or spiritually based nonviolence. So, it, it no longer is a divisive issue. There still is a difference, mm -hmm. but, but the difference isn't causing us any trouble at this point. Mm -hmm. In the same spirit, uh, what do you say to the youngsters? You know, a lot of young people have uh, taken an active role in the U.S. against uh, the proliferation of guns. And so far, it looks like their efforts are not meeting with the kind of success that you would want in a country where so many innocent people die every year in, in mass shootings. Uh, so how, what, what hope do you, uh, you know, share with these young people who are working so hard to change that situation? Personally, Rajani, my hope is that the board game and the film and eventually the book will begin to reach these young people. You know, they are the, the group of people who is probably dearest to my heart of anybody, any, any living being, <laughs> any sentient creatures. Uh, I would, you know, dearly, dearly love to be able to reach them more. And we do have uh, 
we have worked with some young people, this one very young guy, high schooler, who's part of our Friday Hope Tanks. And I have uh, an irrepressible optimism about those young people. And I have a, a very strong feeling that they can be reached by nonviolence. They are wide open for it. They are fed up with the old story. And, you, you know, I used to say that strategic nonviolence is an attempt to incorporate nonviolence into the old story, which doesn't get you very Principled nonviolence is the nonviolence of the new story. And I feel that uh, these young people from the little bit I have been able to interact with them are ready to hear this. So we, we're hoping that we will be able to, as we develop the third harmony project and the fourth element of it is a social media campaign, which we're starting very soon, just got a small grant, we're about to get a small grant to launch it. I'm, I'm hoping we'll be able to reach them. And I, I have every uh, expectation that they won't be hard to read. Uh, in closing, Michael, can you please say more about the Meta Center and you run such wonderful courses, helping ordinary people to find their way to uh, nonviolence as a daily life practice. Uh, so in closing, can you briefly tell us what is the mission and uh, of Meta Center, and is that what keeps you going? That you know that you have that daily <laughs> sadhana of Meta Center. Yeah. Well, the, the mission has several different forms. The shortest one is promoting nonviolence worldwide, and the slightly longer one, which is more descriptive, really, is helping people practice nonviolence more safely and more effectively. And we're doing this work uh, on many different levels. As I said, you know, the Third Harmony Project itself has a wonderful documentary film. Uh, in, in fact, it, it, the website for that is thirdharmony.org. We have the book, we have a board game, we're about to launch a campaign. And then beyond that, we, we have courses. We're, we're having right now, just starting a course that we're calling a nonviolence retreat which is a self-paced, of course, online offering where I will be talking with people and they will be studying a body of materials that we recommend. So we, we really have a, a huge um, repertoire, if you will, of resources for people and they can get to it to our website, metacenter.org. And this, of course, is the Buddhist meta with two Ts, not the Greek meta with one T. Uh, and uh, it does keep me going, absolutely. My, it's my, let me put it this way. Uh, I am a practitioner of Raja Yoga. So that means my primary sadhana is meditation and the disciplines that go directly with that, the repeating of mantra and practicing one point, et cetera. But I am also a, a karma yogi within that spectrum so i have to work off my karma and i have to engage myself which is you know quite a considerable backlog and i have to engage myself in the world of action and i'm supremely happy every day that uh with our small team you know we have a marvelous uh, executive director who, who lives right here in the ashram now and with this really small team, we were able to do so much work. And I would really welcome all of your readers and listeners to uh, come get to know us, get involved and see how we can collaborate and help each other. Thank you very much.